this is, I guess, uh, bonus material uh, from one standpoint or maybe a further tax from another standpoint, I don't know. Uh, Matt and I are going to talk a bit about some of the more practical issues that come up when you work with big data. And you know, most of the time, yesterday and today, we've been talking mainly about issues when the data are kind of wide. That is, you have a lot of variables or a lot of dimensions of the data. Um, another very in important and I think increasingly important issue that people are facing is when data is long. That is, you have a lot of units or observations in the data. And the combination of those also, I think, is becoming increasingly important. And some of the data sets we've already talked about are really, really large in terms of number of units and also huge in terms of number of dimensions of the data, especially when you start thinking about tax and the like. And that just raises a lot of practical issues that people doing research, empirical research at the frontier of kind of data size and data richness are having to face whether we like it or not. Um, and so Matt and I want to spend a little time talking about just nuts and bolts, practical issues about working with data and organizing code especially geared towards worrying about situations where the data are large, the code is complicated, and so keeping track of things and worrying about things like parallelization and data storage uh, and efficient computing are really, really important high return activities. Okay, So we're going to try to talk about questions that people are going to face in, in their daily research lives, like here's your two terabyte data set that you got from your data provider, here's the external hard drive it arrived on, where do you want to put it? Okay, what are you going to do with this now? You can't just load it into Stata in a working memory. You have to put it somewhere in order to be able to work with it. How do you store it? Okay, do you put it in a bunch of flat files? Do you put it in one big flat file? Do you try to just you know, buy the really advanced version of Stata that handles two terabytes of data, or, or what do you do? Okay. Um, and something that's probably worth saying is neither Matt nor I is a computer scientist. That's, that's probably not worth saying because it's going to be so obvious. Uh, we'll, we'll do our best to prove that to you. Um, we're also not software engineers. And um, we're just mainly trying to not so much tell you how to do things, but more point you in the direction of who are the relevant experts in these different areas. So where do you go to learn more? And what kinds of directions should you head off in? when you confront these problems. So mainly we want to be a portal to other resources rather than propose, rather than standing up as, as the, the ultimate experts ourselves. Okay. Um, and you know, I think the good news, the, 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 there is a lot of what we've talked about, a lot of the computing like that Taddy was doing yesterday that you can just do, fire up on your laptop, load your data into working memory, open R as he showed you, run one line of code and boom, you've got your beautiful coefficient plots and your penalty paths and, and all that great stuff. Okay? Um, but uh, uh, increasingly, people are confronting data that don't have that property. So like the, congressional, the text of the US congressional record that Matt and I have worked with a lot, that's about 50 gigabytes. If you, blow, if you throw the PDFs in there, so you think about the images and the formatting, that's half a terabyte. The Nielsen scanner data, which is data on transaction records for 35,000 stores, over a period of like five or six years that we have at Booth. That's about five terabytes. All of the text on Wikipedia is about six. The 20% sample of the Medicare claims data, uh, that's about 10 terabytes. Facebook uh, is 100,000 terabytes by somebody's, I don't know, Matt put this together, I don't know where that came from. And then all the data in the world, which I think actually, this can't be right, because all the data in the world is already on Facebook, but um, <laughs> somebody thinks there's data that isn't on Facebook, and that amounts to about 2.7 billion terabytes. Okay, so in principle, there's a lot of data out there that you might like to uh, uh, apply statistical analysis to, and at some point, you're not going to be able to just take it in your laptop, put it in working memory and rock and roll. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to spend a little time talking about more nuts and bolts issues of like software engineering. How do you organize code and data, especially when you're collaborating with other people? And then Matt will come up and talk about issues that really more relate to data size, like databases and cluster computing. Try to walk through some different scenarios of you know, size of data and type of analysis you want to perform, and maybe give some guidance as to you know, how to organize that kind of work. Okay, and uh, this bit on what we're calling software engineering for economists, Matt and I have some written notes on this uh, subject which are linked uh, right now at the bottom of the page for this workshop. So if you go there and you want to read more, you can read more. Okay, so you know we got interested in this topic because we realized that even though um, you know our original passion that got us interested in economics was finding interesting data sets and good research questions and sensible methodologies, doing all the things that the econometricians earlier called heuristics. Um, 
what we actually ended up spending a lot of our time doing was just writing and debugging code. Okay, working with code and wrestling with it and unwinding other people's code, trying to figure out what it was doing, and then unwinding our code later uh, when we forgot what we were thinking when we wrote it. And so uh, uh, we started uh, finding ourselves lots of frustrating situations that may resonate. Like we would go back to an old uh, directory where we had done some analysis and try to run it, and lo and behold, a key input file, the one that's at the top of the do file, was not there, so the code broke. Whoops. Okay, or uh, we'd try to use a data set that somebody put together and we'd find that actually uh, we have populations for null states. What is the state that has population 653,177? Who knows? Now this calls the whole data set into question and we can't use it because it doesn't make any logical sense. We can't really interpret anything from these data. Or uh, we'd want to change the set of control variables in our regressions and because we duplicated the same information dozens of times, we'd just be copying and pasting all day. Okay, um, or we'd go to a directory and uh, where we had tried to, you know, be careful and name files in a useful way, but we realized that there are different uh, confounding versions. Like this one says use this one, but then why do we have this one? Uh, so which one am I supposed to use? Who am I supposed to believe? The name of this file or the name of that file? Okay, and we can't get back our original results. That's pretty frustrating. Okay, replication is a basic aspect of doing science. And you know this kind of situation makes that really hard. Or even worse, you, know, you might find yourself with tons and tons of different versions of the same file where you and your co-author have conscientiously tagged them all with dates and your initials. And good luck trying to figure out, if you want to get to the current results, how you're supposed to use these files to get there. OK? So as I said, we are not uh, software engineers. We don't, nobody hires us to write software for them. And there's a good reason for that. Um, we're not computer scientists, but what we have learned is that most, if not all, of the common problems like this that we are all facing that are frustrating us when we're dealing with the computing and trying to get the computing out of the way so we can do the analysis we really find exciting, have analogs in software design or software development contexts. And taking advantage of the methods people have developed elsewhere and the concepts people have developed elsewhere can improve your productivity a lot at very, very little cost to you, if any. Okay? And so today I want to just, I'm not going to explain in detail all the principles involved. And uh, the notes that we wrote up have some more information. They also point to some really useful references by experts. So we'll point you to that. Rather, what I'm going to try to do is highlight very briefly how you can try to solve some of these problems, how you can use well-known methods to address them. And I'm going to focus on incremental changes, things that are one step away from how you're doing things now, so not huge you know, infrastructural changes to how you work, but just single incremental changes in one direction or another that are going to greatly improve your life and remove some of the headaches that I showed you on those screenshots. Okay, so let me hit a few points that I think are really uh, important and then I'll turn it over to Matt to talk about issues with uh, data of large size or computational problems of large scale. Okay, so let me first talk about automation, okay? What is important to automate in doing research? Okay, so and to, to motivate things today, I'm going to talk about a hypothetical example um, of a Matt and Jesse paper, which is about the effect of introducing television in different counties in the U.S. on the consumption of potato chips. Okay, if you don't know our research, that's fine. You won't get the joke. Um, but uh, uh, in any case, that's what we'll talk about. So we got our, a data set from a data provider that tells us um, how many people, how many uh, bags of potato chips were bought in every county in the U.S. in every year from some period through some period of time? And the data also include uh, when television was introduced in that county. Okay? And we have to decide what to do with these data. Okay? And one approach, which um, uh, most of you probably have already learned by now, and most of us learned like in graduate school or maybe before that is not a good approach, is something like the following. Open the spreadsheet hit save as, output both of the, the worksheets to text files, open Stata, load the data sets, merge the files together, compute the log of chip sales, run the regression of log of chip sales on a dummy for whether the place has television, do a select all, copy all the output to Microsoft Word, save that, close everything, delete all the files that you made along the way except for maybe the original data, and go write your paper. Okay, That's like the fully hands-on manual approach. No steps are automated except in version of a matrix. Um, and a lot of people, there are actually, I do know of people who use this approach today. 
not going to name names because um, I'm on camera, but um, they're out there. Um, there are two main reasons not to do this, okay? There is a scientific reason, which is uh, it's important for you and for others to be able to get back to every number you ended up with from the data source. That is, if somebody wants to follow your work, this approach gives them no way to do that. How are they supposed to find the source of every number if you yourself have no pipeline from the data down to the uh, uh, final source? And the second issue is um, one of efficiency. Okay, and that's the one that, that maybe is the more immediate concern. If we want to change something about our specification, maybe we want to use the square root of potato chip sales or just the level of potato chip sales. We have to go back and repeat all of these nuisance steps and ideally remember how we did them before so we don't change anything inadvertently along the way. Okay, we really don't want to have to do that. Okay, so uh, uh, a lot of people uh, are having face that frustration probably switched to what I'd call the semi-automated approach. Okay, semi-automated approach is you script at least a bunch of the steps. Okay, so now we've got a script that uh, cleans the data and another script that merges the files together and another script that runs the regressions. I don't know what regressions alt does. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, and we've got something called uh, this extract. Maybe this is the original data, and here's our data on potato chips and so on. So now maybe it's a little bit easier. If we want to go and change something, we just have to change one of these scripts. The problem is, how do we know which script to change? And if we want to rerun the whole pipeline, like let's say we get a revision to the data, of the data set from the source, they send back and say, oops, we actually messed up a few of the potato chip numbers. We've gone to retype them, and they've changed. How do we know what order to execute these steps? Okay. A really simple solution that takes you from semi-automation to full automation is to write a shell script in your favorite language. This is a DOS version. You could write it in Bash if you like Linux. If you want to be slick and OS independent, you could write it in Python. Um, that's what we do. Um, that's going to automate all of these steps uh, 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 from start to finish and handle the calling of these different scripts for you. Okay, why is this nice? It's two reasons. One, it's very convenient. Okay, now when you want to run all the steps from export the files from Excel down to uh, compile your text file, uh, you can just double click or run your script. You have a single command to execute to your operating system. Okay, the other thing that's great about this is even if you were never actually going to run this script, the fact that it's there means you've intrinsically documented the order of operations. Now you know exactly in what order things need to be executed. Much of that's obvious. Like you know probably you should compile the, the, the paper at the end, not at the beginning before you run the code. But a lot of it's not obvious. Like does clean data take data from merge files dot do or, or the reverse? Who knows? Okay, the names of the files don't say. So this avoids you having to go sift through the files, try to figure out what order to run things in. And if you want to be really cool, we've always been tempted to do this, but we've never done it. You could write a little script at the end here that submits your paper to a journal. Um, <laughs> we haven't gotten that far. Okay, and this way, you know, using a shell script like this or some other kind of glue language like Python is great because it's really natural to call other all kinds of different things. Like you can call stat transfer, you can call Stata, you can call your LaTeX compiler. You could perform OS operations like copying and moving files around. Now you have a natural interface in which to do that. Okay, by the way, um, this is this is really just a poor man's. Uh, sort of one directory version of a much bigger framework which is used in software development called Make, which is much more elaborate than this, which is basically what's used when software that you buy is compiled. It's compiled using something called Make. And what Make does is basically it establishes a framework to take source code and produce a target, say, executable file. And what Make does is it keeps track of dependencies so that if I change one resource and I leave the other ones intact, Make knows which things need to be recompiled and update, updated and which things don't because it understands the dependencies among all the pieces. So this is a really kind of a poor man's really low, low level version of something that uh, uh, is much more sophisticated in the actual world of software engineering. Okay. Another tool I want to talk about from the world of software engineering is called version control. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the example I started with earlier of the, the directory filled with different uh, versions of the same file. So here we have 
our directory, and we have the February 21st, 2013 version of clean data, and the February 21st, 2013 underscore JMS, that's my, those are my initials version of the file, and then another version from the same day with A at the end, and then other versions from other dates. Okay, and so we're using, this is a common convention I see a lot when I look at other people's code, we're using dates to demarcate versions and initials to demarcate authors. Okay, and I understand why there's, a, there's an incentive to do this. Okay, it's clear what the motivation is. People want to be able to compare. That is, you want to know, well, why did the results change between February 21st and February 27th? And this gives you a way to do that. And also, it facilitates undo. So, like, if I make a mistake, Mac can just delete the underscore JMS versions of the files and go back to the, the happy world before I got involved in the project. Okay, so you can really easily undo things. And, and I understand those motivations, but um, this, this approach is an enormous pain. Okay, and, um, and why is it a pain? It's a pain because it, you have to remember every time you make a change that you want to consider a new version to tag the file with your initials and the date. Okay, and that also means that if you aren't incredibly diligent, this approach is confusing. For example, if you look closely and you're, you kind of know your stata, you might notice that there's a do file, February, the February 27th regressions file, that has no corresponding log file. So now, uh, uh, which, which file is it that's output by that one? Does it overwrite the February 24th file or does it overwrite this file? If I want to know what results I got, from the February 27th version of this regression, this regression file, where do I go? Okay, so the burden on you to be diligent is incredibly high because if you're not, this is actually worse than no system at all. Now your system's completely broken down, you've lost complete track of where everything uh, is. And another thing since we're economists that I'll point out to you is you don't own a single piece of commercial software that you've paid for that is developed using this method, okay? If Google was developing code by just putting little dates at the end of uh, files, you would not get any search results back, I promise. Okay, what do software firms do? They use various types of version control software. Version control just sits on top of your file system. So it's basically another layer of your file system. And it understands what it means for there to be two versions of the same file. Okay, so you no longer have to manually keep track of different dates or who edited what because now you have a version control system sitting on top of your file structure that understands that. And it's going to manage conflicts. So, for example, if Matt and I both try to change the same regression specification in a different way, it's going to throw up a flag and say, hey, you guys need to reconcile your changes. You tried to do things that are in conflict with each other. You need to fix that. Why is that nice and why is that essential to collaborative code writing, why does every single software firm that ever sold you a piece of software use that kind of system? Because this way there's always one authoritative version of everything, the current version, and you can edit without fear. Now you have an undo command for your entire file system. If I want to go back to the state of my files on February 24th, I just click a button to do that. Okay, what does your life look like after you implement this? Okay, these are now my files, I took away all those annoying dates and initials. Now I have these little green check marks which uh, in the version control system we use tell us these are unmodified versions. These are the same as the current version, the authoritative version. And if I want to go and look at, say, what has changed in this file over time, I just right click on Windows and I'll get a little log that tells me all the changes that have ever been made and who made them and what they were thinking when they made them. Okay, so if I want to go back and understand something, I can do that. And if I want to know how two versions of the file differ or how my current version that's sitting on my computer differs from the authoritative version that lives, in, say, on a server someplace, I just click a button and now I get a highlighted difference engine that tells me the difference between the code. Here's what's been added and if something had been subtracted, there'd be a little red line showing me what was taken out. So now I can get an immediate comparison between the version I'm working on and the current version or between any other two versions if I want to see, say, why Matt added some specification or what changed between two versions of the data. And if I want to go back and undo Matt's changes, I just click a little button called revert and erase Matt from my uh, code uh, and go back to life, uh, say, February 14th. Uh, before the February 4th to 27th uh, modifications. And by the way, there's a little bit more detail on this in the notes we'll post. If you're really diligent in the way you use this uh, kind of method, use version control, you can guarantee your replicability of your, of your codes or your code or your directories really, really easily by basically just making sure you execute all the steps in your run directory script every time 
before you, uh, uh, before you uh, tell the version control system that you've got a new authoritative version. Okay, that's a little aside. And that brings me to what goes into a directory. How do you organize your files to make them most useful? A lot of people um, use a kind of single directory, single project model. So I have a directory that does everything in my project, everything from soup to nuts, takes the original data, extracts it, cleans it up, merges things, runs regressions. And I, that's actually, you know, that's a reasonably attractive approach for fairly small contained projects. It's simple. Um, a problem with that approach is it makes it hard to figure out the dependencies among the files. So for example, if I want to know if something changes chips.csv, do I need to rerun clean data or not? Or is that going to impact regressions.do? Uh, or does regressions.do only depend on TV, TV data.dta? This kind of directory structure doesn't tell me that. Uh, a more natural style, we would argue, is to split up the directories into functional groups. So for example, in this case, you might have a directory that builds the data and a directory that analyzes the data. Why is this nice? OK, well, now I can see immediately that chips.csv and tv.csv, these are just temporary files that are used in building tvdata.dta. That's really the only thing that's used as an input into my regression analysis. OK. Another nice thing about this is that I have the same, I can use the same resource, tvdata.dta, for multiple projects. So if I want to go and write another analysis directory for a different project, say not about potato chips, but about tortilla chips, OK, because we're really branching out our research interests, then I can do that and still call the same resource from that's built over here. So I can use this code for lots of different projects, whereas if I use this approach where everything's aggregated together, that's going to be much harder to do. OK, Matt's going to talk in detail about database design. Let me pause on a couple uh, important things to note about how to organize data. Uh, we used to face the problem of getting data sets back like this from our research assistants, some of whom are in the room, um, where, you know, for example, we'd, and, and, and we'd be tearing our hair out because, for example, um, we've got uh, uh, Virginia in two different regions. Okay, the state of Virginia is in two different census regions. That doesn't seem like that could make a whole lot of sense. Or why do we have no state for this county, but it has a state population? that looks like the same population as other counties in New York, that doesn't look right. Okay, So why do we have uh, 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 all these incoherent features of the data? Or why do we have a missing county in a county data set? What's the point of that? What is that trying to communicate to me, the user of the data, other than somebody made a mistake somewhere, and I don't know what it is? Okay, So this data set, it's useless because it's illogical. Okay, I can't tell. I know that there are mistakes. The data set's illogical. I don't know what mistakes were made. Um, but I can guarantee that I can't just go and use these data in a straightforward way without trying to reverse engineer what the actual intended logic was. Okay? If your bank stored data like this, then what would happen is when you would go to withdraw money from the ATM, either nothing would happen or you would take somebody else's money out of the ATM or you'd withdraw the state population of New York from the ATM or something like that. Okay? <laughs> So you have to know basically just logic about how the world works tells you this cannot be best practice for storing data. Okay? And in fact, it is nothing close to that. Okay? Data are stored when they're used in, in uh, say, for, in transaction systems like at a grocery store or a bank. Ultimately, they're stored in something called a relational database or a transactional database um, where basically the data are required to be structured in a logical way. The physical shape of the data encodes its logic. So every variable in the data is an attribute of an element, like an observation. And every table, which is a group of elements, has a key. Like in this table, it would be the county code. Or in this table, it would be the state postal code that has to be unique and non-missing for every element in the table. Okay? And then if I want to relate, that's why it's called a relational database, if I want to relate items between tables, if I want to know what's the state population that corresponds to this county, then I do a join between the tables and I use what's called a foreign key, that is here's the key for the state table living inside the county table to execute that join. Okay? And these are very simple, encoded in this logic is a very simple set of rules for storing data in what's called normalized form. Okay, and Matt will talk again about that later. 
And if you store data in normalized form and impose these rules on yourself, you're going to save yourself from a lot of hassles like this. Okay? So the way we would recommend now, the, uh, a problem with storing data in normalized form is you can't run regressions on normalized data. You need matrices. So you might need state population alongside county population. So what do you do? Basically, and again, there's more detail in the notes we've post, what we advocate is something like the following. Store your data normalized using the logical structure of a relational database. Okay, and Matt will talk about actual relational database systems. For small data, you can get away with flat files like CSV files or Stata data files if you like that. Okay, for medium-sized data or larger data, or depending on, on your comfort level, you could go to more an actual relational database system. It's not that hard to do. Okay, so store your data in this normalized form. Construct a second set of data files where you've made your key transformations, like you've taken the log of population or whatever you're going to need for your analysis, and then do the join between the tables at the last possible stage, as close to your analysis as possible. And if you follow those rules, you're going to avoid a lot of hassles, and you're going to find your data makes sense to you six months later, after you haven't looked at it in a while, in a way that it might not if you're doing all kinds of joins really high up in your, in your data analysis pipeline. Okay, and Matt will talk about what to do when your data are really big. Okay, next principle that's probably worth mentioning is called abstraction. Okay, that's a principle we all know. Go back to our example of rampant duplication. Here I've got the same controls in like 10 different regressions. We all know that's annoying because it means that if I want to make a change, I have to copy and paste that change line after line after line. That introduces a lot of possibility of mistakes. So I want to cut that down. It creates unnecessary work and lots of potential for error. And so the way most people handle that is by doing things like this. Like in Stata, maybe I create a little local to store the names of the variables I want to use as my controls. So if I want to change my control set, I just change my local once. I don't have to go change it every time. And everybody probably already is doing that. Okay. What may be less obvious, but is kind of common practice in writing software, is to do the same thing with operations. Okay, so here I'm doing it with like lists of things. There I was doing a list of things. I can also do it for functional operations. So, for example, I might want to calculate the leave out mean of uh, per, tap, per capita potato chip consumption. Okay, so I might want to know the average potato chip consumption of all the counties in the state except this county for some empirical Bayes analysis or you know, as a control variable or whatever. It doesn't matter why. Okay, and so I might go and write code to do that. But I, maybe I also want the leave out mean within the metro area. So the average of all the counties, not this county within the metro area. Or the average of all the counties, not this county within the metro area. But now I want household level consumption instead of per capita consumption. So per household consumption. And the way I've accomplished that in this little example is I went and copied and pasted the first set of code, and then I modify it as needed in the second set and the third set. The problem is, uh, the usual problem with copying and pasting and modifying like this, I made a lot of mistakes. So for example, I left the state identifier in over here by accident, and over here I used per capita potato consumption where I should have been using house per household consumption, and so now I've made one leave out mean and two pieces of garbage that if I use them in my analysis are going to be totally wrong and misleading. Okay, and what does abstraction do in this case? Basically, it creates the abstract version of what I'm trying to do. In this case, compute the mean of something within a group, leaving out uh, a particular instance, okay, the leave out mean, and uh, replaces all of these calls, all of, this, all of these, this, this jumble of code with calls to an abstract function called leave out mean, which is really, really easy to do in Stata, and it's even easier to do in other languages that are more designed around writing function or object-oriented program. Now I've eliminated the need to copy and paste. When I want to change from state to metro area, I change it once in the logical place, the group variable. I don't have to change it over and over again. And I'm letting the code do the work of remembering what a leave out mean is. A great advantage of this is if I need it for another project or if I want to do it again, I have it already written. I don't have to write it again from scratch. Okay. One of the things you might think, given how obsessive we are about uh, all of these other things, is that we love writing notes. Okay? Maybe we like to write directories that look like this, with tons of notes, notes underscore data, and notes underscore data underscore demo, and notes underscore identification, and various readmes, and memos about 
readmes and other documents that tell you which documents you need to look at. Okay, that approach uh, is tempting when the code is not clear, because when the code is not clear, you're tempted to fix that by trying to explain it to yourself or other people by writing lots of documents. But writing lots of documents, kind of like keeping track of versions by, by changing dates and using your initials is a dangerous game. Because once you start playing that game, you have to keep pedaling to, 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 to keep up with the changes to your code. For example, if you do this, if you write directories like this, I pretty much guarantee you one day you'll wake up, open up your directory, and find something like this where your, your, your documentation, which is supposed to tell you the list of variables in your data set, has a different list of variables than is actually in your data set. So what was the point of this documentation, actually, that you spent all this time writing? Was it to confuse your future self or your collaborators? Or was it to remind you that actually this should have per capita income, not median income is in it? Who knows? OK, now you have a conflict between your notes to yourself and your data, and there's no real way to resolve this conflict. OK, or you might have a memo about your results that, tell, that includes a copy of this data output. OK, but now your memo has a slightly different coefficient than your stata logs do. Which one's the right one? Were you intending to send your future self a message, beware of 0.1347? Or is there some reason why actually the code's right and the document's wrong? Who knows? Do you have to go back and change the document? OK, will you really do the work to keep up your documentation every time you touch your code? I bet you will not. OK, and as a result, you will end up with a lot of confusing, useless documentation that is actually worse than no documentation. A better use of your time, OK, another example here, which I see a lot is when I download, when I download other people's code is here's a, and you'll probably find it in some of mine if you look carefully, here's a header declaring what this do file does, only it's wrong. This do file is not run regressions.do running regressions, it's append files.do appending files. So what was the point of typing this out? What was I accomplishing? Nothing. Just confusing myself. OK, so first step is delete all that stuff. Now, Problem with deleting it is maybe it's impossible to interpret what's going on in your code. <laughs> okay, so here's my do file unclear code dot do. I calculate el, the ratio of 0.4 to 0.2, and then I comp wolf, <laughs> and I'm done. Okay, and that that might confuse me. So maybe I should start writing memos again to myself, explaining what the comp wolf procedure is. Okay, stop yourself. Stop yourself from doing that and ask yourself, is there a way I could change the code so that next time I look at it, I will know what's going on? For example, maybe instead of calling this L, I could call it elasticity. And instead of just having a floating magic number here, 0.4, that came from nowhere, I could write percent change in quantity. And for, for 0.2, I could write percent change in price. So now it's obvious why the ratio of those has some meaning that's called an elasticity. And why is that input into CompWolf? Well, because that's actually called compute welfare loss. OK, and if you know your Harburger's triangles, you know that elasticities are going to be useful for that. So I've turned useless code that I couldn't use for anything without writing documentation that risks becoming out of date into useful code that is self-documenting. I'm using the structure of the language, in this case, data, but it could be anything, to help remind myself when I look back at this later or my co-authors, what is going on in this code? What is it trying to do? Okay, it takes almost no work to do this. It, it, it takes, it'll probably save you, you'll break even within hours of work if you adopt, adopt this approach, if not faster. And uh, it means that you can delete all of those memos and other things explaining comp, the CompWolf procedure and other, and what EL probably stands for and so on. Okay. Now, these kinds of te techniques are, are great when you're working alone. They're incredibly important when you're working with other people. And if you just look at trends in co-authorship rates, you're see, you can see very clearly that rates of co-authorship have been exploding in economics. There's a lot more collaborative research, especially in applied work, but not limited there. And so keeping track of, of other people's work is really important. And that elevates the value of all of this stuff. Because if you don't know what Kumpwolf means, surely your collaborators are not going to know what it means. Okay. Another piece of collaborating together is being smart about keeping track of who's doing what. Okay, and this is how we used to do that. We used to do it over email, and we might end up having an email exchange that would be something like this. Hey, Matt, 
Do you have that robustness check where we control for the amount of ranch dip sold in each county? Because I'm writing the section on dipping sauces and I wanted to mention it. And Matt might write back, sorry, I thought you were doing that because it's similar to that other thing you were doing where you were controlling for salsa sales. But let me know anyway if you want me to do it or, or if, you, if, if you want to do it. And then I would write back CCing our third co-author, Mike Sinkinson, who's written some stuff with us. And I might say, no, I thought Matt was doing ranch dip and Mike was doing the salsa dip. I wasn't doing either of those because I like to sit back and relax. Uh, Mike write, might write back and say, no, I did the salsa robustness check already two weeks ago. See my email from August 14th at 9.36 AM, which is a great help and really easy way to go find stuff. And then I might say, actually, in that email, you were controlling for the log of salsa consumption. But actually, I wrote you back on August 14th, and I said we, we wanted the level of salsa consumption, not the log of salsa consumption. OK, I'm on it. Now, at the end of this email thread, which has taken an incredibly long time, we still don't know who's doing the thing where we have to control for ranch dip. So we've gotten nowhere on the original purpose of the email, and we've only barely managed to unwind the error we made on August 14th, where we had this miscommunication about how we were going to do this salsa uh, uh, regression. Once again, if this is how Microsoft kept track of like who, if Microsoft's pr process was going to be like add in line spell checking to Microsoft Word, let's just send an email to a guy and say, hey, you know, Fred, can you add inline spell checking to Microsoft Word? Yeah, totally, I'm on that. <laughs> there would be no inline spell checking in Microsoft Word, OK, for sure. Um, they don't use a system like this. They use a much more complex system, probably a proprietary one to Microsoft. You don't need to be Microsoft to fix this problem. There are free systems like Asana, which is a free online task management system that allows you to have a group of users working on the same project and to make unambiguous the assignment of tasks to users. So if I want to have a salsa robustness check task, I, Jesse, can assign that to Mike Sinkinson. You can't see this maybe, but I've assigned it to Michael S. And I can make explicit what I want him to do. And then if we need to have task relevant communication, that can be threaded and connected to the original task. So if I want to look back and see what's going on with the task at any point in time, I just click a link, open the browser, and uh, look right back at the task. And now if Mike wants to ask me a question like, do you want to control for the log or the level of salsa consumption, we can keep track of that. And what we want to know later when Matt wants to know, say, why do we do the level of salsa consumption and not the log? Whose idea was that? He can go back and find out that it's my fault. That's what I asked Mike to do. OK? So, and then when Mike thinks he's done, he can just click a little button and say, this is complete. Get a little green check mark on there. And then there's no ambiguity that Mike believes, at least, that the task is done. Okay, And whether I believe that or not is another matter. I could reopen the task, or I'll get a notification via email that the task is complete. All of this is completely free. You could be up and running on this in like two seconds. I can show it to you on my phone afterwards if you want to see it. Um, and actually, the version control software I showed you before, by the way, is also free, open source. So nothing we're talking about today requires spending any money. And almost none of it requires spending any time, actually. This, this would take you like two seconds to learn. This is like iPhone kind of software, very cleanly designed and beautiful, easy to use. OK? Can you mention the name of the version control software? Yes. Uh, uh, the question was, what's the name of the version control software? It is called Subversion. Subversion. Yeah. But there are a lot of them out there. Uh, you can pick the one that you like. But that's the one we use. And the, uh, name of the, task management? the name of the task management system is Asana, A-S-A-N-A. And if you're Googling that, you'll probably get some yoga links. <laughs> Just s skip past those pretty soon. This software is very good, so I, I suspect it will soon uh, surpass the yoga links in, in, in Google status, but I don't know. And you can, get, you can download the iPhone app or whatever. It's, you, you can use it through the browser. So if you're, if you're following along at home, I think it's just Asana.com, but if you Google Asana, A-S-A-N-A, -A, you'll, you'll see it. And Subversion, if you Google Subversion, uh, you will actually give, get the software and not the concept of subverting. <laughs> so, you know, um, again, we are, you know, we are not the pros in any of this. We are trying to be a portal to point you towards professional solutions to common software problems. But what we, what we I think, can be useful in doing is just pointing out you are going, if you're doing applied work, empirical work, you're going to be dealing with larger data over time, more complex data, and very likely with lots of collaboration. And you're going to find yourself spending a lot of your time not thinking deep thoughts or wondering about what would be some interesting problems, but just wrestling with your code and other people's code and your data and other people's data. And you're going to find that 
adopting the practices used by people who do that kind of thing for a living and who live and die by doing it well is going to save you a lot of time and frustration. In a very short amount of time adopting these methods, you're going to find you're, you'll, have, you'll have broken even within hours or maybe a day and you'll, have, you'll be gaining productivity every day from doing this stuff. And if you dig deeper and push further in the direction of best practices, you're going to do even better than that. So um, try to learn from professionals. Again, we have some resources online. And um, make your life easier. There's no reason not to. I'll take questions maybe before I turn it to Matt. Questions on this stuff? Yeah. So when you work in, uh, on code with people at other institutions, um, are there any, uh, is, is it the subversion I imagine is a local hosting thing as a general matter? So how do you, like, how do you work with uh, other so, yeah, so the question was, how do you collaborate like with people at other institutions, say if you're using a, a, a version control system? And the answer is, um, that's pretty straightforward. So for example, there are actually some free online sites that will host this stuff for you. So uh, like a lot of people use GitHub. Um, I think there's one called Bitbucket, CloudForge, which distributes a version. Um, maintains one. So there's a lot of them. You know, I'm not an expert in those, but there are a lot of them. Some of them, mo most of them have a freemium kind of model where you can get a free, something free right now. You could go on and have your own repository like in five minutes. And then if you wanted a lot of users or some other richness, then they would charge you some monthly fee or whatever for that. You can also set up your own version of this hosted on your PC or hosted like even better for more stability on an Apache server. And then you could have other people access it remotely. That's going to be, you know, there are going to be the usual data security issues that you'd have with any file system, like just your regular file system. You have to worry about who's authorized to access what and whatever. So you have the same access control system kind of issues you'd face with any file system. But, um, but this allows you to at least contain the, the conflicts and the workflow and stuff like that into a collaborative file system. Yeah, question back there. Are we OK on time for questions, Matt? Yeah, question back there. OK, so this is a little bit of an in-the-weeds question about version control, but a, a question I, I, I'm happy to answer. So the question is, can you, only use, can you use version control for binary files or only um, like word processing files or ASCII files? So, and the answer is yes, you can. Um, we, we routinely do that. Um, version control systems are really designed to integrate best with code. So they're designed to work great with ASCII files. They're incredibly efficient at storing ASCII files because if I change, say I have a, a two gigabyte file and I change one number, the version control system, the increment to the storage on my computer from making that change is trivial because the version control system just stores the instructions to go from the earlier version to the new version. So the storage and cost is really, really small. And you have a diff engine. If you want to find where did the change happen, it's trivial to do because it's built to do that. With binaries, that kind of process is harder because there's no way like, so a binary would be like an executable or a stated data file, something that isn't stored in ASCII, like we're in a character set. There's no way for the, a general purpose diff engine to go inside and see the differences between files. But you can still store them in there. And we do that because it's convenient to be able to find old versions of things. That increases the storage cost, so you have to manage that a little bit. But yes, technically it's no problem. You use some of the some of the functionality, but you retain the ability to see revision histories, track who did what, and imp importantly, I think for replicability, you retain the ability to go back to particular versions of data sets, like if you're using Stata binaries or or whatever, and that's really really nice. So there's depending on your purposes, if you look at around it, like what firms do, you'd find some that version their data, others that don't. It kind of depends in part on how important is it to be able to recover the state of the database at a point in time. So for firms that don't care about that, they don't do that. If they just care about today's inventory, they might not worry about that. They just have a backup of the current snapshot. Other firms that might need to know, why did we execute this transaction on this date this way, they will retain uh, like a version file system for, the, for even their data. Steve Sakala, question. So once upon a time, there were people who preferred to have all of their new files, all of their state working like a single master new file. Right. And here now you, you're creating, I don't know if they're a or you're creating another program that's getting called, how do you 
manage, control, the proliferation of open a directory of like just like a dudes running around all over the place. To so, um, so the question was basically, once you get away from, say, you know, one directory with a giant file in it, so Steve, Steve's asking about a model where I have one, say, say I'm going to work in Stata, I have one do file that does everything, okay? The advantage of that is I have only one place to look. Once, I'm, once I go to this approach, I might have little function files running around all over the place. I might have a lot of files to tackle. How do I keep track of all of those, whatever? Um, and the answer is, Basically, that's exactly what um, it. That's exactly the kind of thing that these file systems, like version control, are built to do. So, for example, if you're in a software firm and you write a function to perform some operation, like execute a transaction or something like that, or even a more basic operation, you know, like modify a database, you don't write that function for every single purpose every time. You keep it in a library, and then you call the library you call access to the library every time you need it. And there are various ways to do that. You could do that without using version control. You can do that inside version control. And there's some notes on how to do that in the, the link that we've got up on the site. But basically, the answer is you just need to teach your directories to grab resources from other directories. And that's actually not that hard to do. And if you do it in a smart way, you can actually set things up so that you have only relative file paths in your code. You never have to have that big thing at the top of your code that may, many of you might have right now, where here it says global data directory, and then it says C slash blah, 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 global code directory with libraries, C slash blah, blah, blah. You can get rid of all of that and let uh, uh, the directory structure handle a lot of that for you. OK. Follow-up question from Steve, or should we just, let, I'll take your question later. Let's let Matt come up. OK. So. Um, Basically, all of the stuff that Jesse just talked about is is common sense best practice for computing whether your data is big or your data is small or your data is high dimensional or your data is low dimensional. I now want to talk just very briefly about a few computing issues that get towards stuff specific to working with big data. Um, and again, it's going to be very brief. I'm, the, the goal here is not to actually teach you anything about uh, these topics really, in part because I'm no expert, but just to give you a flavor of the sorts of things you ought to go learn about if you're working with these kinds of problems and some kind of practical advice for, given a particular scenario, what sorts of things might you want to do. Um, so I'm going to talk about databases, I'm going to talk about collaborative or distributed computing, and then I'm going to talk briefly about some scenarios. So in terms of databases, um, the, the first thing to say is, there are two things that are pretty different. One is database theory, which is a body of theory in computer science on how to efficiently store, organize, and retrieve data. Second is database software, things like SQL and Oracle, that are software that implements those kinds of principles uh, to actually manage that stuff on a computer. And, it, and it, part, part of the point, you know, Jesse had that little section on keys where he was talking about um, why you might want to store your data uh, in separate tables that have non-missing keys and so forth. I mean, one of the points I think to emphasize is just understanding and applying the principles of database theory is a really good idea even if you're not using database software. These are, these are principles that apply very broadly. Anybody working with data should understand and apply those principles. Database software is, is something that you ought to know about and perhaps use in certain circumstances where you end up using really big data sets. Okay. So a couple of just quick thoughts on, on what are the principles, the kinds of principles in, in that, that have underlied database theory. The first is something called normalization. So according to Wikipedia, database normalization is the process of organizing the fields and tables of a database to minimize redundancy and dependency. Usually this involves taking some big table like Jesse's county level data set that included state population and region and all these other things and dividing it into smaller and less redundant tables and defining relationships between them with uh, things like foreign keys. So practically speaking, the kind of key most important thing that normalization involves is A, Store your data in such a way that A, every file, every table 
has a unique non-missing key for every observation. So there's some variable like county code in a county table that uniquely identifies every observation. And two, every variable in every table is a logical property of that entity that it's keyed on. So if it's a county table, it only has county level variables. If it's a state table, it only has state level variables. That's kind of the, the core most important uh, uh, element of normalization. There's, there's a whole list. There's something called first normal form and second normal form and third normal form and fourth normal form and a whole bunch of you know, different increasing levels of uh, uh, normalization that imply eliminating more and more redundancy. So, for example, higher levels of normalization involve make sure that there's no variable in your table that could be derived from other variables in your table, et cetera. Okay? So, as Jesse was saying, you know, we in our research have come to believe basically any time, wherever possible, even if you're just working with text files or state of files, you should always store your data in normalized tables until the last minute when you have to put it together to, into a single matrix to run X prime X inverse or whatever you're doing. So why did normalization evolve to be a key part of database theory? I think originally, this was primarily about efficiency of storage and efficiency of transactions modifications in databases. So if you have a county table that involves a bunch of state level variables, you're representing the same information many, many, many times. The state population of New York is repeated in a bunch of rows, right? Redundancy involves storing the same information many times. If you're, you know, running the database for Citibank and you do that, uh, you're going to end, and if you, if you store all of the state level characteristics in every individual's observations, you end up with a really big data set. So originally this is a lot about, you know, storage is scarce. You're trying to uh, make that efficient. So normalization helps. It also helps with the computational efficiency of databases because if your data is not normalized and you want to change something like the state population of New York, you have to go in and change it many, many, many times. That also takes time. Those are, those are kind of the, the original motivations. There are also two other benefits of normalization that explain why we think, or we've kind of come to believe, at least for ourselves, that this is a good way to store data. One, it guarantees the logical coherence of the data. So you can't have something like a state population for an observation with a missing state indicator. And perhaps least obvious, but, but kind of most important or, or among the most important, it makes really transparent to the user the logical structure of the data. So when you get some new data set that you don't know what it is and you look at it, it's much, much clearer when the structure of the data itself documents which variables are defined at which levels of aggregation, what are the relationships among all of the variables in the data. So the first two relate to why this is a good idea for big data sets. The second two relate to why it's a good idea for all data sets. Okay. So a second key principle that underlies the development of databases and why there's such a thing as database software is indexing. So as an example, we talked, uh, Jesse mentioned at the beginning, that NBR on our servers has about 10 terabytes of Medicare, of claims data from Medicare over a little more than 10 years. The way those files are currently stored on the NBR servers is in a bunch of individual zipped SAS files. So there are lots of directories across these different years that hold thousands and thousands and thousands of files that together comprise this claims data. And this is not a crazy lot. I mean, this is a very common way to uh, store data. And in some circumstances, this might be the optimal way to store data. Notice, however, a property of storing data that way, which is suppose I wanted to do something like extract all claims for heart disease patients aged 55 to 65. What would the computer have to do in order to do that? It has to open every single one of those thousand files and read every line of every single one of those thousand files. So many, many RAs 
working in health economics over the years have written scripts that go in and open these files, that loop through all of those files, opening each one, extracting the relevant observations, and storing them. And again, there's nothing that there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but an observation is that's slow. Right? So what is what might you and if, if you imagine now again, you know, United Airlines wants to look up your airline reservation when you get to the counter, imagine if the United Airlines server now has to go open up every file containing every record for every passenger who has ever flown on United Airlines, searching through until it finds the one for you, airline reservation systems wouldn't work very well. So what, you know, what might be a solution to this? Well, there's something called indexing, which is not a particularly new concept we already know about. Right? The obvious solution that we have long understood for books, libraries, etc., is to build an index. Right? The, the sort of store all the files in flat files on a server approach is the equivalent of the Library of Congress puts all the books on the shelves and says, you want to find you know, the, uh, an economics textbook, start on the first floor, on the first shelf, start reading through all the books, keep going until you find the one you're looking for doesn't work very well. Clearly, the solution is to build an index so you can look up that book, know where it is. And that's exactly what database software does. It allows you to specify particular fields of the data that are going to be relevant for looking up observations, for choosing subsets, et cetera, for doing joins, and build indexes of those variables. So when you say, I want patients age 65, if the variable age is indexed, it tells you the locations on disk of all, all records or it, it does this in the background, you don't, but implicitly it tells you the location on disk of all records for 65-year-olds, and now you only have to look at those records. Right? So we could index age, gender, type of treatment, et cetera, and that would allow much faster extraction in the context of database software. So the, the obvious benefits of, of indexing, and therefore, by extension, the obvious benefits of working with actual database software are, one, you can look things up fast, two, this is crucial to the way that software works. Indexing makes, allows it to, to, to be feasible in real time to impose constraints on the data like a key has to be unique. Because if I add a new observation to a data set where the key is supposed to be unique, the database software has to look at all other observations to make sure the, key, the, va the value of that key that I included for this observation does not already exist. Right? That's an operation it has to do a million times. Uh, every day, and so that becomes efficient. If there's an index, it just has to look at the index. It doesn't have to have to start opening up the actual data files. Now, there there are important costs of indexes too. One, you have to store them, and they can be really big, be on you know similar order to the data itself if the if the values are close to unique, and it takes time because every time we change something in the data, we have to update the index. Going through a large five terabyte database and building an index the first time for some variable takes, takes a long time. And this is where, among other places, this, the real sort of art and science and skill of people who know how to use databases, unlike us uh, who don't, really comes into play. Because optimizing a database involves thinking about how do we design the structure and how do we design the indexing to make the operations that we actually need to do efficient. And there's no right answer to that. It depends on what operations you want to do. So database optimization is, is the art of tuning a database to the particular needs of a particular application. And that's what a lot of the, um, you know, the real work of, of people who know uh, a lot about data, database design involves. Now, just, just because this term gets thrown around, another thing that you'll hear people talk about are data warehouses which you might think is a synonym for databases. And it's not quite a synonym. It's something slightly different, which actually is quite relevant to uh, the kind of things we do. So traditional databases, SQL, Oracle, et cetera, were designed, built, and used for operational environments, things like the airline reservation system, transactions at your bank, et cetera. And if you think about those environments, they share a number of particular characteristics. First, 
the transactions with the database involve a lot of small reads and writes in kind of equal proportions. You know, you change your airline reservation or you check in, so it has to go say you've checked in, you show up at the counter, it needs to retrieve your reservation. There's lots of back and forth, lots of small transactions, including both reads and writes. It is crucial that a database like that be robust to many users accessing the data simultaneously because United is hitting that database from all kinds of places all over the world at the same time. And it can't be the case that it breaks if I try to look at Jesse's reservation at the same time that somebody else tries to look at Jesse's reservation. Latency, which means how long does it take from the time that I initialize, that I, that I put in a request to do something before that kind of gets up and running. That delay time is really crucial because if every, if there's a, a 20 second delay at the beginning of every transaction, the thing's not gonna work. And typically, United Airlines doesn't care too much about what its database looked like a year ago. It just cares a lot about what the database looks like today. In analytic or research environments, this includes what we do, but also where a lot of this stuff is developed, it includes business environments where people want to use their data now for analytics to like figure out which customers to market to or something. The requirements are very different. Instead of lots of small reads and writes, typically the data are pretty static. The Medicare claims data hasn't changed much since we first downloaded it. Once a year it changes. And there typically it changes because we add a bunch more. Unless we go in and maybe restructure things or clean some things up, the main part of the data is not going to change. And so writes are infrequent, reads are frequent, and reads tend to be large. It's common for people to do things like, I would like to read a terabyte of data. Simultaneous access is not a big deal. Latency is not such a big deal because the transactions are often big. So the startup, the fixed cost doesn't matter too much if the variable cost is, is huge. We often care about history and and typically, in these kinds of environments, unlike the operational environments, there's, there's the raw data, and then there's a whole pipeline of extracts of that data and extracts of those extracts that get produced that are the things that people actually want to use. And when computation is slow, it's not efficient to every time somebody wants to ask a new question about, say, what was aggregate medical spending in California in 2002, to go back and recompute that from the raw claims data, it's nice to produce once an extract that has state by year level total spending and store that and everybody can work with that. So you need to sort of manage these custom extracts. So I won't say anything more about this, but you know, the books you want to read if you're interested in how do you design things efficiently for this kind of situation are, you know, search for data warehouse on Amazon. That's what data warehouses are database systems tuned to these requirements. And that typically means, in a company, that typically means we have our operational database, and then we have alongside that a data warehouse, which periodically pulls the data from the database and stores it in a different form that will be efficient for doing this kind of analysis. Okay? So the second topic I want to talk about is distributed computing. So the first is about storage. This is about um, actually computing the all of these great high dimensional econometric methods as well as other things. So distributed computing obviously, as everybody knows, means computation shared among many independent CPUs. Um, there's lots of kind of confusing terminology flying around, none of which has precise definitions. People will talk about distributed computing and also talk about parallel computing. Those don't have precise, there's no precisely defined difference between them, but typically parallel refers to systems that have, say, shared memory and a bunch of processors, like you know, your PC might have a bunch of uh, different processors, whereas distributed refers to more across uh, machines that have their own memory. Talk about cluster computing and grid computing. Again, there's no fine definition, but cluster computing typically refers to some more, like in a room there are 100 PC, PCs on a rack that form a cluster. Uh, and they're all the same and they're all in one place, whereas grids often refer to all over the world. We have some network of lots of different computers that have different specifications, but they're all connected and we can farm jobs out to all of them. Um, so one important thing to note 
about distributed computing is just your computer already does this, your phone does this, um, you know, your, your operating system knows how to work with multiple processors, each of which has multiple cores, your video card on your computer probably has hundreds of or perhaps thousands of cores, um, and standard statistical software knows how to exploit these things without you doing too much work. So Stata, all you need to do to do distributed computing is buy something called Stata MP and run it uh, on a computer that actually has multiple cores, but there are no computers anymore that don't, so you're in good shape. Uh, in our MATLAB, uh, or, you know, or even lower level languages, obviously those things give you more control, so you, you have more direct control over this. Basically, there's some add-in package, typically there's several in R, but, but the one people use a lot is called Parallel. There's a parallel computing toolbox in MATLAB. You just need to install those things, and then you control in your code which things are going to be parallelized. So for example, in MATLAB, there's something called a par for loop. If you wrote code that had a for loop in it, which says, you know, do this operation 100, do, do some sequence of steps 100 times, but using different values for this indexing variable, that's a naturally parallelizable operation, assuming it satisfies certain conditions. If instead of writing for, you write par for, then MATLAB will send the, the, the step for i equals 1 to one processor, and the step for i equals 2 to another processor, and the step for i equals 3 to another processor, and distribute that. So you control it in MATLAB. If we move away from your local PC to think about clusters and grids, larger networks of computers, you don't want eight processors, you want 80 processors. Um, all of you presumably have access to lots of such resources. All of our universities have computing clusters of various kinds. There are non-commercial scientific computing grids that are collaborations among lots of institutions distributed all over the world. Those are things that you can apply, basically, you put in an application, say, I'm a graduate student at such and such institution, or I'm a faculty member, and get access. And then you can run code on those very large uh, computing grids. And there are commercial grids, like Amazon has something called EC2. Lots of people use, the, those have gotten to be very good. So anybody who wants to do uh, you know, higher level distributed computing, there are lots of resources. Um, how does it work? For those of you who haven't done this kind of thing, what does it mean in practice to say, run some code on the EC2 cluster? It just means you write whatever code you would have written, and you have to think about writing it in a way that, that, it, that you know how it's going to be distributed, so which operations are going to be sent where, and then the, the actual distribution of that across the nodes is controlled on the back end by something called a batch scheduler. And you write, a, you know, just like Jesse was talking about, you write a, a, a bash script or a, a shell script that is sort of a master script controlling everything that includes instructions to the batch scheduler for where to send things. So if you've broken your code, you know, think about code that you've written like the for loop where basically I want to execute this code, but I want to replace the file name. I want to loop over 100 files. Right? That would be a natural thing. Then you just write, you just write a batch script that says, you know, here is the variable I want to basically loop over, and the batch scheduler will know I'm going to take each of those executions with a given file name and send them off to different nodes, get back the results. Okay. Um, so that you can do. For you know, basically any code uh, with with relatively little overhead, really relatively little additional work. For for projects for for uh, applications where the distributed part of the computing becomes very important, um, one of the things that's useful to know about is a is a framework called MapReduce, right? or what's also called Hadoop. The, the open source implementation is called Hadoop. So what is MapReduce? It, it is software, but really, basically, you want to think of it as, as a conceptual model for programming. So this is very much like what Jesse said about abstraction in code. You're doing a, a leave out mean. You find yourself writing code to do that over and over and over. Wouldn't it be nice to instead write that code once, and now that always will be done, handled automatically, and your code is really legible and clear, and all you have to see is the important stuff that you're changing. This is kind of the same thing, which, you know, this originated at Google, and basically the guys at Google felt like 
you know, we're doing all of this distributed computing, and every time we do anything, we have to write code to figure out how to cut things up into different pieces and which processors to send them to and how to handle the, er the output when it comes back and how to handle errors. And like 80% of our code is stuff which isn't specific to what we're doing right now. It's stuff that's about the distributed computing. Wouldn't it be nice to abstract that and only have the code encode the, the pieces of it which are new and specific to this application? So this is a, mo a model for programming that facilitates that. Um, so the insight is almost all algorithms for distributed data processing can be represented in two steps. The name MapReduce comes from calling those two steps, map and reduce. And uh, think about you have some data, like Google's cache of the entire internet. It's broken up into a bunch of little chunks. The map step says, for each chunk, apply some algorithm which maps the, the, the raw chunk of data into some summary, some much smaller summary. That, and I'll talk about examples in a second. And the reduce step says, now retrieve those summaries that you've produced for all these different chunks and combine them in some way. At a very abstract level, that is a representation which uh, applies to almost anything you can think of doing in distributed computing or a large share. And the point of MapReduce was if you can represent your software in that way, if you can represent your code in that way, the MapReduce will take care of all of the distributed computing part because it knows now how to do that in a generic way for whatever you're doing. Right? So MapReduce software will then handle partitioning the data, scheduling ex execution, managing communication between mach machines, handling errors, handling failures of machines, and so forth. Um, so examples of the kinds of things, the kind of operations you could put into this framework. Suppose I have a large collection of, say, news articles, and I want to produce counts of all of the words in those news articles. Well, the map step would be take each individual document and map it to a vector of word count pairs. And the reduce step would be take all those vectors from all those different documents and collapse them into a single uh, sum of those counts. If I wanted to do this thing of extracting medical claims for 65-year-old males, the map step would be to take a set of records and map it to the subset of those that are 65-year-old males. And the reduce step would be to just combine those things together. So often, you'll see that the reduce step is often, can often be kind of a trivial, just combine everything. Um, you might recall from Jesse's presentation of, of uh, our slant paper, the, this marginal regression that we were using to generate the slant index involved basically separately regress y on, eat, on counts of each phrase individually. So it's like for every phrase in the data set, you run one regression. That's naturally parallelizable because those regressions can all be done separately. So the map step there would be run the regression basically for phrase j, and the reduce step would be combine those coefficients together in the way, in the way that we need. Um, this is, this is a kind of schematic of the way this actually works. Um, in, the, in the original kind of Google implementation, the, the one, you don't, we're not going to spend time on the details of this, just one thing to observe. Part of the reason, you know, that the reduce step is in this process is because in, in large operations, you want to be able to do the mapping and the reducing in parallel and have those things be going on at the same time. And so the way this structure works, your program sends instructions to a master that controls scheduling that assigns to a bunch of workers to do the map step. The output from those individual map steps are stored somewhere, and the master also provides information so that a bunch of other nodes that are going to do the reduce step can start reading from those in parallel while this is still going on. So there's a bunch of, the, there's a paper, you know, the, if you Google MapReduce, you'll see the original journal article published by Google on this, uh, which is super clear and easy to read and, and really interesting because it gives you a sense of all of the stuff that this does in the back end. Um, so there are lots of implementations of this. Nobody uses MapReduce because that's the proprietary thing that Google has, but there's an open source implementation called Hadoop, and Amazon has a hosted implementation called Amazon EMR, which is really easy to use. So if you have some problem you want to do this way, you can pay a little to have an account on Amazon and run it there. Um, and all you have to do is basically write, literally all you have to do is write your code so there is some script which you can call the map script and some script which you can call the reduce script, and you're done. Okay. 
So that's distributed computing, um, a distinct but closely related concept is distributed file systems. So you can do distributed computing with files that are all stored in one place, and then you basically have to move data out to each of the nodes that are going to do computing. Um, a key thing to understand is anytime you're doing distributed computing, the moving around of data is typically the crucial bottleneck that slows everything down. So when the data is really big, if you said, OK, I'm going to farm this out to 200 nodes, and I need to move this five terabytes of Medicare data over to each one of those nodes, that's not going to work very well. In those kinds of cases, what, I, what, what works much more efficiently is to break the data up into chunks. Those each live on separate nodes. And there's a file system on top that keeps track of where they are and knows how to allocate jobs in a smart way so that an individual operation is done somewhere that's physically close to the relevant data. So ideally, you know, the best thing from the scheduler's point of view is I can allocate each job so the data to do that job is already on that machine. Next best is the data somewhere physically very close to that machine so the transfer happens fast. And this is closely related uh, to, to, to MapReduce on the software side. So basically, for any implementation of MapReduce, there's an associated file system, and those things are designed to work closely together. So Hadoop has something called the Hadoop Distributed File System. Amazon has, along with the Hadoop hosting, they also have their distributed storage system, which they call S3. So basically, if you sign up to, you know, for a, an account on Amazon and do this, you get distributed storage for free. Or not, you pay for it, but you don't have to do any work to, to do it. You get it not for free, um, but not too hard. Okay, so here is, here is sort of the schematic for, from the, the Google file system paper for the way this works. Again, you know, there's, there's a, there is a master scheduler that keeps track of where all of the files are. So when you send a request like, I would like to read a given file, you send that request to the scheduler. The scheduler knows where all of the uh, individual pieces are. And a crucial, again, you can look at this. It's, it's all kind of interesting. A, a, a key issue here is the thing would work very badly if the model was you tell the master which pieces you want. The master goes out and collects all of those pieces. And then the master hands them back to you. Because then the master becomes a huge bottleneck in the system. Right? Everything has to flow through there, and everything slows way down. So the way this actually works is the master tells you, uh, you know, this is all, you don't see it, but tells your software where the pieces are you want. You then send and, and sends requests for those things, and then the individual chunk servers where these things are stored send you the data directly. So there's no bottleneck. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to say, those are, that's just to give you a flavor of, you know, some of the things that are out there that you might want to learn about. Now, concretely, kind of when you're doing research, you know, what ought you be doing? Should you all run out, like, you know, and, and rewrite all of your code to work uh, on, on Amazon's Hadoop cluster? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, so I want to give you basically three scenarios. So scenario one is the easy one, which is my data are big, but maybe not that big. So sort of on the order that you could fit into working memory. 100 gigabytes or less, or 50 gigabytes or less, something like that. And I think in, the, in these cases, basically, you don't need database software. You, you, you don't need to do distributed storage of your data. Distributed storage of your data would probably slow you way down. Basically, you can store the data the way you're used to. You should, as we've been stressing, I would say, organize it into normalized tables for robustness, for clarity, 